We have uh, just an hour devoted to a huge topic and a big canvas to paint on, and we're going to try to keep this moving as quickly as possible so uh, we can really tap the expertise of, of the panel we've assembled. Um, we are really fortunate at Heller and Brandeis to have uh, people who are, are uniquely qualified um, to discuss the challenges of COVID-19 uh, as it affects the economy and social policy. And uh, I'm just delighted and honored to have the three uh, colleagues of mine who are here today. Um, Lisa Lynch is the provost of Brandeis University and the Maurice uh, B. Hexter Professor of Social and Economic Policy, a uh, member of the faculty here at Brandeis, of course, and also a former dean of the Heller School. Uh, Provost Lynch is also a member of the Economic Advisory Panel of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. She served as chief economist at the Department of Labor in the Clinton administration, uh, and also held, has held numerous other uh, roles in the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, uh, giving her a, a unique perspective on these issues. Um, Dolores Acevedo Garcia is the Samuel F. and Rose B. Gingold Professor of Human Development and Social Policy here at the Heller School. She's also the director of our Institute of Child, Youth, and Family Policy. And Dolores is also a member of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health COVID-19 Health, uh, Health Equity Advisory Group, uh, where she's been thinking about these issues, um, both in terms of the analysis of them and also policy. And finally, Bob Kuttner is the Meyer and Ida Kirstein Professor in Social Planning and Administration here at the Heller School. Uh, he is a very prominent um, social a commentator on economic policy and is, of course, the co-founder and the former editor of The American Prospect. Um, so um, we really have our bases covered here in thinking about the economic and social impacts of COVID. Um, the economic consequences of this pandemic are in so many ways on a scale we have not seen in this country um, in our lifetime. Um, and I know our panelists are going to speak about this in greater detail, but um, you don't have to be hyperbolic to, to, to talk about the enormity of this crisis. We have more than 30 million people who have filed for unemployment benefits in just the last seven weeks. Um, and that's probably an understatement for reasons we'll probably talk about uh, in, in terms of the people who really are eligible for those benefits. Uh, an unemployment rate that was announced last week at 14.7%. It also probably understates the enormity of a dislocation. Um, and if you go industry by industry, you see job losses that, that just astound the mind. Um, uh, you know, the hotel industry having lost something like 90% of employment um, in this period of, of time. And equally, if you look around the globe, we see a clap of economic, um, the, the economic position of, of, of countries around the world uh, in, in many ways are, that are still in a free fall. Um, and then we can talk about the personal impacts. These are the numbers. There are, there are human beings behind every number that we count. Uh, and of course, it's not just the individual costs uh, of, of economic dislocation and of the, of, of the COVID crisis itself on people, um, but also the very disparate impacts. The fact that uh, COVID has not hit all groups equally, but has fallen particularly heavily on communities of color, uh, low wage workers, um, and vulnerable segments of our population. Um, so there's a lot to talk about today. Um, and what I want to start with is ask um, each of the panelists um, to give your individual assessment of what you regard as the two to three major impacts of concern for you in this economic, and I define economic broadly, uh, pandemic. And let me, let me start with uh, you, Lisa. Okay, so I'm going to continue the um, bleak uh, numbers that David already started in just sort of setting the stage for thinking about um, both what has been done on the policy front and then understanding what else absolutely must be done 
um, on the policy front in, um, to address um, this most um, unprecedented um, moment that we're, we're in. You know, in addition to the 30 million people who um, have filed for unemployment insurance, um, we found out in the last um, report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, for the month of April that uh, total non-farm payroll employment fell to over 21 million jobs in just one month, which is just extraordinary to lose that many jobs just in one month. That was the month of April. So I was already into some of the job loss that started back in March from COVID-19. All of the gains in employment that we saw from the recovery from the Great Recession of 2008 have been wiped out and more. Um, the unemployment rate, as David said, arose to 14.7% for the month of April. That means 20, more than 23 million people officially unemployed in a very narrow definition of unemployment. That's the highest unemployment rate we've had in the United States since the Great Depression. Um, and on top of this, BLS said that if you included people who said that they were employed but were unable to get to their workplace, and not because they were on vacation or sick, but because their workplace was closed, we'd have an unemployment rate over 20%. Um, BLS also reports a broader measure of displacement in the labor market that includes people who've given up looking for work because they're discouraged, there's no jobs available, or people who are working part-time would, would have liked a full-time uh, job. And that rate is close to 23% um, displaced for the month of April. Um, who's been impacted uh, the most? Well, we all, in one way or another, have been impacted by COVID-19. But you see, as David mentioned, you know, folks that are in the leisure and hospitality sector, especially food and accommodation, you know, the month of April, that sector alone lost almost 8 million jobs. Education and health services um, lost a lot of jobs. It's sort of ironic to think about the healthcare sector contracting, but it has been contracting in particular because of um, outpatient care and elective surgeries being closed and those workers being um, laid off. Um, the retail trade obviously has been um, uh, impacted, but so has manufacturing and other services. Women workers have borne the uh, brunt of, in terms of a larger share. They're not the only ones who've been displaced, but 55% of the total job losses in April were um, amongst women workers. One of the unusual characteristics of um, this uh, period of time is that when we look at the people that are unemployed, over 78% of those who are unemployed say they're on temporary layoff. We've never seen numbers that high. Even back in the 1970s, when we had very high unemployment, had about 20% of workers who said they were on temporary layoff. So most people who are currently unemployed believe that this is a temporary state. The question is, when does temporary become permanent? What are the policies that we have in place that preclude that temporary state of bec from becoming a permanent um, place? And one last thing in terms of the official statistics, when you look at the, um, the report, nominal wages in the month of April grew almost 8%. That's just unbelievable. I don't know who those people are who got an 8% increase in wage, not anybody that I know, but um, I just want to highlight the reason why nominal wages looked like they went up so much was because a disproportionate number of low wage workers lost their jobs. So all of a sudden it looks like everybody has higher wages. And in fact, 40% of the loss of jobs has been amongst households making less than $40,000 a year. So when you think again about policies, you have to think in particular at low wage earners being disproportionately hit by this contraction. So we have you know, some detailed, uh, I mean, some um, really innovative policies in some respects in the labor market, the CARES Act, um, extended unemployment insurance benefits, added a supplemental weekly benefit of $600 a week, um, uh, included for the first time people that are in the gig economy, independent contractors to be eligible for unemployment insurance. 
Um, what's on paper doesn't always match what's in practice. There's been a lot of delays in people getting unemployment insurance, and especially those workers who are newly into the pool for unemployment insurance, self-employed and gig workers, states have really struggled to get systems up in place to be able to provide that income security. In principle, there's a short time compensation programs in at least 26 states. In practice, very few states have actually used this kind of mix of reduced hours, but getting some unemployment insurance. So we're, um, it, we have a lot of nice things on paper, but in practice, they've been slow to actually um, implement. Um, occupations that have been particularly impacted are any occupation where you have face-to-face. -face. And um, so, um, other characteristics of this uh, contraction is that the digital divide has only been magnified. Those people like us who can work from home, who can telework, can continue to stay employed. Those people who don't have access to those resources don't have the ability to be part of the digital economy or disproportionately yeah. unemployed. And disparities in the labor market have only been um, heightened. So when I um, think about um, the kinds of policies that we need to have in place, obviously I'd love to see a switch from supporting basically businesses to supporting individuals and their households. Uh, we, we, we're not, uh, I, we've done some on that front, but we need to do much more. Um, but the length of this recession, as you know, wonderful um, fiscal and monetary policies as we might develop, um, the length of this recession is really going to be driven by the health solutions to COVID-19. Um, so in order to get back to normal, we need testing and we need efficacious treatment and we need that before vaccines because a vaccine is not going to help us until probably at least 18 months and that would be a miracle if we get that. So we, we have to be able to do testing and we have to have some improved um, treatments. And without that, it's really hard to imagine how you get the labor market mm -hmm. up and running. And I say that as a provost who's facing the challenge of how might we begin to uh, open up further our own university. Um, and uh, the nature of that testing could, be, um, could generate a new round of sort of insidious problems in the labor market, and I'll leave this for our open discussion. Many countries, including the U.S., are looking at creating certificates for individuals who have been tested for um, antibodies that would give them permission to go back to work because it looks like they have antibodies against COVID-19. I have significant concerns about this, and I know we've got some people with medical backgrounds on, uh, on this call as well. But this type of um, certification of who can go back to work uh, can, can play out in, in very dangerous ways. And, then, and with a um, science that is still immature and incentives for um, abuse that could be rampant. So testing is, is very important. It's gonna be critical for us opening up the economy, but who gets tested, who has access to this testing could be a new dimension of disparities um, in COVID-19. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Lisa, and a lot, a lot for us to come back to as we discuss policies. Um, let me turn to uh, Bob um, for just sort of your opening view of the crisis. Sorry, you're muted, Bob. You're muted is gonna be a new catchphrase of the 21st century. Yeah, yes, it is. So, uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, David. The, the fundamental thing to realize about this depression, and it is a depression, it's not a recession, is that it is uh, different in kind from any uh, depression that this country, or for that matter, any other country, uh, has ever experienced, unless you want to go back to the era of medieval plagues. Uh, so you've got a few kinds of categories of people who are not working. One category is people who have been told not to come to work because it's not safe to work in a situation where you're supposed to be distancing six feet. Then you have people who can't come to work because all of their customers are staying home. And when you add those two categories uh, together, this is probably gonna to top out at a real unemployment rate 
uh, if, you, if you count all the categories that Lisa ticked off, including people who are dropped out of the labor force, it's going to be upwards of 30%. And uh, to put this in perspective, the, the peak of the Great Depression or the trough of the Great Depression, March of 1933, the unemployment rate was 25%. And the dynamics of an ordinary depression, if you can use that word, are, are fundamentally different. So Great Depression being the uh, paradigmatic case, you have a financial collapse that then leads to a debt deflation where uh, the debt against assets is more than the value of the assets. And then demand slowly starts collapsing and people get thrown out of work and they don't go to the grocery store and spend as much money and more people get thrown out of work. And then it keeps bumping downward, bumping downward until the government does something to, about it to heal the financial economy and to restore aggregate demand. Now, in the case of the Great Depression, that took three and a half years from the stock market collapse of October 1929 to the pit of the Great Depression in the spring of 1933. This collapse has played out over three and a half months. So we've never seen anything that has the dynamics of this collapse. We've never seen anything as abrupt as this collapse. And the question, of course, one of the many questions is uh, how many of these losses of industry and of employment are going to be permanent? How many of these companies that have to suspend operations uh, don't have the capital to come back in six months uh, or, or 12 months or 18 months. We also have the public health risk, even if we were doing something, even if we we're doing everything right, and of course we're not doing everything right, that um, things are gonna seem to get better and then there's gonna be tremendous pressure to ease up on the social distancing. And then we're gonna get echoes, we're gonna get wavelets of other concentrations of uh, disease, which is gonna prolong the pandemic. Uh, Northeastern, where my wife teaches, I think made the fundamental error of jumping the gun and announced last week that they're going to reopen in September. I have no idea how they're going to do that. I mean, what kind of social distancing is possible uh, three months from now? And Brandeis and every other university is going to have to face this horrific choice. How do you uh, provide an education that's not 100% Zoom that persuades people to come back. Uh, what mix of very careful live activities and Zoom activities uh, and other kinds of online activities can you have that will allow the university to stay in business if you're not a university with a very flush endowment that can just ride this out? A lot of, a lot of students are just gonna decide to take a gap year. And I think you can extrapolate from the dilemma that universities and colleges are facing the dilemmas that other kinds of businesses are facing. And um, if you look at the categories of workers, uh, to oversimplify, and I'm picking up here on something Lisa said, there are really three categories of workers. There, there are workers who've been told to stay home, either because it's not safe to come to work or because the customers aren't coming. Then there are workers like us who are relatively privileged, very privileged, who can work, um, remote, who are doing uh, professional work, office work, that sort of thing. You have a third category of worker, essential worker, and these are workers who are at, at dire risk of getting sick because they're having to work in close proximity to other workers and to the public. They're, they're everybody from warehouse workers to people who work in grocery stores uh, to people who work in the health sector. And not only are they low wage workers to begin with, with the exception maybe of doctors and, and, and RNs, but um, they're workers who can't afford not to work and they're workers who are not being given adequate uh, equipment to prevent catching the disease. So in an economy that is grotesquely unequal to begin with, um, COVID has highlighted and also intensified uh, all of the inequalities that, that we face, and that's class, that's race, that's occupation, and that's uh, immigrant status. And uh, we, we can talk more in the second round about what some of the remedies might be, but I think for starters, if you look at what we have done, uh, the Fed has, uh, in the jargon, expanded its own balance sheet. What does that mean? 
It means the Fed goes into the market and buys up securities, uh, a lot of which are underwater, and does this to keep the financial part of the economy from collapsing. Uh, its balance sheet, that is to say the total value of the uh, securities that it has purchased, is supposed to go to something like $9 trillion. That's completely unprecedented. In the, in the, in the Great Recession, so-called, it peaked at about $4 trillion. And it's buying up categories of junk that it didn't even buy up uh, in, the, in the 2008 financial collapse. Then you have, of course, uh, the, the, the Treasury, the money that's appropriated by Congress. And uh, you all know that uh, Speaker Pelosi, on top of the 2.7, uh, 2.8 that's already been appropriated, is now uh, proposing another $3 trillion. If anything, that's on the low side. Because if you think of uh, GDP, I apologize for this, I'm going to turn it off. Um, good. <laughs> if, if you look at GDP, GDP is around 21 trillion. Um, if you have a collapse of 30% of GDP, you know, that's upwards of 6 trillion. So if, if you don't want the whole catastrophe to feed on itself, you have to make up that demand uh, one way or another. And unfortunately, we can get into this in the second round. The way we have done this, both on the Federal Reserve side uh, and on the uh, appropriation side, is, is far, far from optimal. Uh, we did this against the background of the government having been stripped of resources, mostly by Republicans, to some extent by Democrats. The, the, the epic example of this is overwhelmed unemployment cop offices, where governors in states that don't have much sympathy for the unemployed not only kept unemployment compensation replacement rates very low, but they, they did not hire adequate people to staff these operations, even in normal times. And you've got uh, computers in these systems that are 30 years out of date. So I will save the discussion of uh, what policies we have been pursuing, which are far from optimal, uh, what policies we should be pursuing for the next round. One comment for the moment, um, Pramila Jayapal, who's one of the two co-chairs of the uh, House Progressive Caucus, has proposed instead of uh, paying people to be unemployed, you should uh, subsidize the employer to not lay them off in the first place at 100% of wages. Uh, several European countries do variants of this. Even though Pelosi is, is going big on this next uh, CARES package, she did not opt for the JPL approach. That's really very, very unfortunate because what you want to do, just in, in, in classic labor market policy terms, you want people not to lose the connection to their employer. And by allowing people to be laid off and then compensating people for the loss of purchasing power to some extent for the layoff, you're disconnecting people from, from uh, the labor market attachment more than you ought to. So I will stop there and we'll continue on round two. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Um, let me turn to Dolores to give us your opening um, thoughts on, on the crisis and, and its impact. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, because I, I actually wanna talk about children, which may seem odd to some people that are joining a webinar on the economic consequences of COVID. So um, I am very concerned about what's gonna happen with children. I'm very specifically concerned about what is gonna happen to minority children. Because as it has been with adults, COVID is gonna affect disproportionately African-American, Hispanic, and Native American children. And of course, that's not an accident. That is gonna happen or is happening already because we went into this crisis uh, with very long standing, very serious inequities and high vulnerability among minority children in this country. And both the health consequences and the economic consequences are gonna have a disproportionate impact on black, Hispanic, and Native American children. And I think it's very important, I'm beginning to see this in some areas, which is uh, obviously a hopeful sign. It's very important that we name this issue of equity explicitly and that the mitigation strategies that we have really address and acknowledge that this is a major aspect of the recovery. 
So some people may be saying, well, we know that um, COVID has not impacted children directly so far in the way it has impacted adults. However, we are already seeing many ways in which the epidemic is affecting and disrupting children's lives. And it's very important to recognize that this is gonna have very long-term effects. Uh, the basis for human development, of course, is what happens in childhood and some children are experiencing a lot of really incredible uh, hardship during this time. And of course, that's not new hardship. That is adding to hardship that their families were already experiencing. For me, it's been interesting because I actually started my career, um, my dissertation work, looking at the relationship between residential segregation in the United States, uh, inequities in neighborhood environment, and infectious diseases. So very sadly, we are coming full circle to what we experienced in the 90s with the resurgence of uh, tuberculosis associated with the AIDS epidemic. And here we are with COVID, facing a similar crisis that is affecting disproportionately minority communities, minority neighborhoods, because the same underlying inequities are driving this process. I was actually pleased that uh, maybe people saw yesterday or the day before yesterday, the New York Times had an editorial piece in which they named residential segregation as a main driver of the inequities that we are seeing with COVID. So, um, Obviously, there was a side of me that was pleased because 25 years later, people are normalizing what I thought it was a pretty obvious connection a long time ago. But obviously, the horrible part about this is that these inequities are so ingrained in how our society functions that it's going to take a long time to address them. Some of my colleagues in public health are actually disturbed that some people are, quote unquote, discovering inequities as a result of COVID because, of course, inequities have been there for a long time and uh, they have played out in many other ways before COVID. So there are two aspects um, that I want to mention just briefly in my initial remarks that I'm particularly concerned about. One of them has to do with the issue of neighborhood inequality. Uh, Black, Hispanic, Native American children experience much worse neighborhood environments than other children. Uh, our research group has used an index that we created that we call the Child Opportunity Index to measure those inequities. And just to give you a sense of the dimension of those inequities, in the 100 largest metropolitan areas, Black children are nearly eight times more likely to live in the very lowest opportunity neighborhoods than white children. And Hispanic children are more than five times more likely to live in those neighborhoods that don't have adequate resources than white children. This is important because some of the risk factors for COVID are heavily concentrated in these very low opportunity neighborhoods. Low wage employment, higher prevalence of pre-existing conditions and lack of health insurance are concentrated in those neighborhoods. Housing overcrowding and higher density, population density are also very highly concentrated in those neighborhoods. So it's not accident that the cases are concentrated there very disturbingly, we are already seeing data that the testing is not concentrated there, but the cases are concentrated there. And of course, the repercussions, the consequences are also going to be highly geographically concentrated and highly impacting minority children. Another issue that I'm really concerned about is child poverty. I had the honor of working on the National Academy of Sciences Committee that uh, put together a report released in 2019, a roadmap to reducing child poverty in the US. Our goal, it was a congressionally mandated committee, our goal was to reduce child poverty by half. And we devised you know, the different policy combinations that can get us to that goal of 50% reduction in poverty for children. What is incredibly serious right now is that by estimates from the Center on uh, poverty and social policy at Columbia University with um, in a scenario of 30% unemployment as a result of COVID, child poverty is going to increase by 50%. So here we are, we were trying to reduce poverty by 50% and we had a lot of discussion about policy options to do that. And here we are with a very real possibility of an increase of 50%, not a decrease. So we're going to have a higher poverty rate. So under that scenario, child poverty in the US could go from 14%, which is already very high compared to other industrialized nations, to 21%. And not only that, but under that scenario, because we know that the 
economic impact is disproportionately affecting Blacks and Latinos, also the inequities in child poverty are going to increase. Not just the, the rates, also the inequities are going to increase even further. And they were already enormous. Uh, to give you a sense of how big they are already, the poverty rate for white children in the U.S. is 8%. For Latino children, they have the highest rate is 22%. And that is predicted to get even more disparate, disparate and higher. So just wanted to start with some of that. Um, obviously looking forward to discussing some possible ways that we can address all these issues. Thank, thank you, Dolores. Um, and, and let's start to get into that. And I'm gonna stay with you, Dolores, for, for, this, for, for, for this next round. Um, I, I think your comments really um, bring the nature of the crisis to um, to, to probably the, the, the level we all are most concerned about, which, which are children and, and the disparate impacts, particularly on children who are African-American, Hispanic, uh, indigenous uh, communities. Um, from what you see, and this could be either the state level policies that I know you, you spend a lot of time thinking about or federal policies, what are the strengths and weaknesses of what we have seen done to date to, to address some of the impacts, maybe particularly as they affect children uh, and their families, uh, specific to the COVID response? Yeah, sure, David. So I'm gonna start with the strengths because I wanna try to send a hopeful message. Um, I am very proud of having been asked to join the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Advisory Board on Health Equity and COVID. And I'm uh, really uh, humbled by the expertise that has been gathered and how people are very, very proactively talking about the equity aspects of the epidemic, from testing to treatment, uh, to connecting the epidemic to social determinants and trying to address those things as well. So one of the key aspects that people have been discussing is that we cannot have a separate discussion about the equity issues in terms of public health and the equity issues in terms of the economic impact that we as a state policy-wise, and it's difficult because we all know that we work in silos, we need to be able to bring those things together and have a discussion about the equity aspects of the epidemic across different sectors for the state. But I think it's a very good start you know, that the Department of Public Health is addressing that. There are other states that are doing something similar. I'm aware that New Jersey and Illinois have similar task forces on equity issues related to the pandemic. And we just need to name those things. We, no one can be talking about this epidemic without naming those issues and pointing to the things that we have to do to try to close some of those gaps. Um, so, let, so that's something that has been happening at state, I'm sure at the local level as well. Uh, let me talk now about a weakness that for me is uh, a very serious uh, issue and is also longstanding, not new to co with COVID, but obviously very apparent now. We have had a social policy regime that excludes immigrants very explicitly now since the mid-1990s. With welfare reform, we made it part of our social policy that we can reduce benefits even for legal immigrants and uh, of course, we have exacerbated um, um, lack of access for immigrants, including legal, also undocumented, uh, during this administration. And there are many ways in which this is playing out. So obviously, you know, to get uh, any funds from the rescue packet, you need to have a social security number. You have to have a documented status in the US. Obviously, the children that are living in mixed families, families where some people may have not documented status in the US are gonna be hurt. But even more uh, um, seriously, we have also excluded from the CARES Act, citizen children, US citizen children, most of them citizen children by birth that, that live in the same household with undocumented immigrants. That is a gap that has already been pointed uh, uh, and send an alert about by the immigrant uh, groups, uh, pro-immigrant groups uh, nationwide, as well as in different states. But in addition to that, although the administration had to uh, clarify that accessing testing and treatment was not gonna be used against immigrants in the sense of using that to deem an immigrant a public charge, which of course is something that the Trump administration had already exacerbated, 
and have created a new rule expanding the definition of public charge. So although they clarify that immigrants may still access without being deemed a public charge, there is a lot of fear, a lot of apprehension. So we really need states and local governments, and I'm hearing a lot of discussions about that, which is encouraging, <coughs> saying that we need to make it explicit, you know, that we need outreach so that immigrant communities can understand what they are eligible for, and they are not afraid to come forward and access what they need. We put ourselves into this mess. You know, we have this exclusionary policy, and now we have to live with the consequences of all the gaps that we have in the system because of that. Thank you, Dolores. Um, let, let me ask um, the same question. Let me turn to Bob on this. Um, strength and weakness is a response to date. You alluded to, to some comments on it. One of the areas I hope you'll speak a little bit to uh, is some of the monetary policy responses versus some of the other responses to date that, that we're seeing. Well, two of the huge weaknesses were, first of all, in the small business program, uh, they took an agency that is, you know, not a very effective agency in the best of circumstances, the Small Business Administration. And then they ran it through private banks uh, where there was a long delay because they were negotiating with the banks what the bank's liability might be. And then they didn't put enough money into it. So here's a case where a direct loan program would have been much, much more effective. I mean, in the Great Depression, we had the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which made direct loans to homeowners who were at risk of losing their homes. Uh, and we also uh, had the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which put public uh, directly into uh, war production. Uh, I think it would be much, much better to have a direct loan program. Uh, similarly, uh, we made a huge mistake, and I mentioned this in the first round, in the, in the way we did uh, assistance to uh, to workers who've lost their jobs. It would be much better to do payroll protection, literally as payroll protection, where you make it possible for people, workers, to stay on company payrolls. Um, in World War II, they had two interesting provisions. One was called the renegotiation board. The other was an excess profits tax. And so because of the war, they had cost plus contracts. And then if it turned out that uh, a corporation had made windfall gains, the government would uh, claw those back either directly through renegotiating the contract or through an excess profits tax. So if you had that as part of the CARES approach, you could say to a corporation or to a family, you certify what your situation is. And if it turns out that you weren't being truthful uh, or if it turns out that you uh, had windfall profits, We'll, we'll work that out afterwards. But for the moment, let's get adequate funding out there. I think coming out the other side of this, the way to do this is massive public works, public infrastructure, green transition, the kind of investment that we should be doing anyway. Uh, what the private sector has shown with all of its stock buybacks is that the private sector has not been able to identify sufficient quantities of productive investment opportunities. So instead, they use all these tax cuts, they use their profits to engage in stock buybacks to pump up the value of the stock to enrich the insiders. Uh, this tells you that the private sector is not equal to what needs to be done, and that's gonna be true in spades coming out of the pandemic. So assuming the politics break right, and that's a very big assumption that depends in many respects on us, this is the moment for public options. This is the moment for the public sector to step into the breach, to do the kind of infrastructure investment, green transition investment, which tends to be rather labor intensive, uh, to take back some technologies that we've lost. And um, this has, of course, a demand side aspect as well. Uh, puts a lot of people back to work, puts a lot of purchasing power back into the economy. And once it is prudent to resume construction, we're going to need this kind of massive uh, recovery program. One horrible irony that's a function of the inept leadership from the Trump administration, construction projects that could have continued were suspended. Why? Because construction workers use the same N95 masks that healthcare workers use. And so all of the N95 masks had to go first to healthcare workers. 
construction workers who wanted to work, who had job opportunities, were sent home because there, were not, there, there was not enough safety equipment to go around. And that's just one mini example of how we're paying, all of us are paying, for the corruption and the incompetence that characterizes the Trump administration's uh, response to the pandemic. Thank you, Bob. Um, let me pose the same question to you, Lisa, um, but I'm going to throw in something that one of our um, attendees has asked in, in the um, comment area, and that is, particular to the CARES Act, there is a critique that uh, with some of these supplemental benefits people have and the, and the $600 additional assistance people are being given under COVID, that that is acting against what the CARES Act is trying to do in terms of rest restoring aggregate employment and demand. Um, your thoughts on that, but also the broader question of what's working. Yeah. So let me let me first say, you know, in, in the sort of following on what Dolores was saying, um, one uh, piece of good news in this entire crisis is that I think there is a new appreci appreciation across the political spectrum of the deep and important connection between a healthy society and a healthy economy. Um, I think to date we've been able in the United States to somehow or other think that healthcare and, and access to healthcare is something that's independent of anything else that we do in our uh, economy and we can sort of set that off into some separate box and not worry about the impact on the economy. But with COVID-19, I think we've seen just so starkly how um, health for our society is critical for our economy. With respect to um, CARES, um, it's certainly, you know, people have talked about this potential distortion uh, that if um, individuals can um, end up actually taking home more pay or um, let alone even the same amount of pay between unemployment insurance and the additional $600 a week, um, uh, that that creates a disincentive for people to come back uh, to work. So two things I'll say about that. When you look at how much money that actually is that people are taking home with that, um, that could be fixed by a minimum wage of $15 an hour. You would get rid of some of those disincentives mighty quickly. Um, and it is interesting to see many employers recognizing, okay, well, then we need to raise wages. And when you look at the wages that they're raising, too, to get people coming back, it's wage rates like $15, $16 an hour. Um, but, you know, the, the number of people who've actually, um, you know, the types of jobs that people have um, lost that are low-wage jobs, are jobs that put these individuals at risk, not only the individuals, but their entire families. And I think Dolores, you know, uh, spoke, um, in, you know, really shed a lot of light on what this means when an individual in a household, in a densely um, populated household or community, what that, what that means in the context of a, of a pandemic. But I wanna to return to what Bob uh, said, it, one of the unfortunate things was that before COVID-19, there had actually been a lot of work that had been done in 26 states, actually 27, but only 26 states had actually set up the structure to have short time compensation programs, which would encourage employers to move away from layoffs, which has been the, you know, the margin that historically in the US we've opted for when we've had a, a collapse of labor demand and instead to reduce hours and have workers collect unemployment insurance in addition to a wage rate to create that connection. And um, in spite of that, going into this crisis, in spite of the fact that we had 26 states that had operational programs, we've seen very modest uptake of those programs. So the employers have not been willing to sort of sit down and work out arrangements and work with the state unemployment insurance office to, to put in place these short time compensation programs. And I think that this is an important area that really we need to double down on. And we can do it now. We have an infrastructure, at least in, in 26 states, we have an infrastructure in place and that needs to be something that immediately 
um, there's much greater focus to get at this issue that, that Bob raised, that for at least the remaining <laughs> employees here, as the, you know, sort of negative consequences of, of being, you know, 30 or 40 percent contraction in our economy play out, that we don't create a vicious circle and further contract the economy, but find ways to keep people connected with their employer. Thank you. Um, and I, I would, and I think you all have, have, have nicely laid out a number of the people or the problems that have been revealed that pre-existed this pandemic. And I would just uh, add to that um, the inadequacy is of our workplace policies in general, the fact that we have uh, very poor protections for things as fundamental as paid sick days or paid sick leave, which push people to make the wrong kinds of choices when they're sick, having to ultimately decide to work even though they are sick, exposing others and potentially the public. Um, the inadequacy of coverage of a lot of people who fall outside the loop, which, which the CARES Act has tried, um, uh, but as I think a um, few of you have mentioned, has not successfully addressed in any um, systematic way. Um, and, and, and then the basics of health and safety protections that, that again, the, the, the structure of making sure that we engage in a, a thoughtful um, protection of, of the workforce in general, and particularly when facing a pandemic has been revealed. Um, we are, um, this was a big canvas. We have a lot to paint with. I do wanna to get to a couple of the questions that have come in, but let me, before I get to that, let me ask you, you all have mentioned sort of the policies you'd like to, to put in place. Um, let me ask as the closing question, I think it'd be interesting for people to hear, what are the num what are the, what are you looking at when you scan the paper every day, the uncertainties that concern you about figuring out what needs to be done, how long this is gonna last, where are we going? Um, what are the things that you are worried about and watching in terms of thinking about the longer term consequences um, of, of the pandemic? Uh, let me start with you, Lisa, and we'll, we'll go through. Well, I'll just, I'll bring it sort of local um, as a person, you know, with a, you know, a large university to try to figure out, you know, how we move, move our university forward. For me, the, num the number one thing that I obsess about that I look uh, every day at what new news there is on is what is the availability of reliable, rigorous, um, and a capacity for frequent testing for individuals across the board, not just symptomatic, but asymptomatic individuals. Uh, because for me, I don't see how I can open up the university. Bob, I don't see how we could open up construction sites. I don't see how we open up any part of our economy. Uh, before a vaccine is available, if we cannot do testing in ways well beyond anything that we have seen thus far. Um, and in particular, because we now understand that people that are asymptomatic are, can be spreading the disease, we have to be able to um, test individuals who are not presenting any symptoms or don't feel like they're presenting any symptoms. And in particular, in a university where we would have a disproportionate number of both younger individuals and a disproportionate number of older individuals, we have to be able to do that in order to open the university. So for me, you know, the availability of testing, and it, and it has to be testing that's not $100 a pop or $250 a pop because I need to be able to test more than 6,000 people at some high frequency uh, over and over again over the course of the year so that when we experience these wavelets that Bob talked about, I have a chance, you know, in my local environment to be able to identify and isolate and quarantine individuals and have a chance to keep um, us from becoming a hotspot. Without that, honestly, I just don't see a way forward that is something other than being remote. Bob, what are you watching? Well, just to pick up where Lisa left off, I mean, I'm watching the politics and the leadership that we're getting uh, 
either from Washington or from the states. And if we could get the Trump administration to do one thing competently, either force them to do it through Congress, the single most important thing would be the thing that Lisa's talked about, have an adequate supply of reliable tests. They've lied about that. They waffled on the policy. Uh, Germany, France, most European countries, this is not rocket science. They figured out how to produce enough tests and they test people regularly. I guess the other thing I look at the politics on is whether this time uh, the Democrats in Congress are going to realize that they have more leverage over the Republicans maybe than they think they had last time. Um, there actually are as many red states as there are blue states, and the red states are going broke too. Uh, state and local government spent $3 trillion last year. Their revenues are going to be down 30 or 40 percent. You do the arithmetic, they need the trillion dollars that Pelosi is talking about uh, appropriating. I don't know whether uh, McConnell can stand that pressure if he tries to hold out for this ridiculous idea of holding all corporations harmless for any kind of liability. Uh, and interestingly, there may be a possibility of triangulating in that Trump uh, has this uh, economy that he's going to have to live down. It's in his interest to go as big as, as Pelosi wants to go. So maybe you can, you can play off uh, Trump against McConnell. But the next package has to be big. It has to be the right package. Uh, the Democrats somehow have to get their act together. And rather than putting pressure on Trump on 100 different fronts, let's pick out a few things, like testing, that maybe we can gain some ground on. Thanks, Bob. Um, uh, and uh, uh, finally, Dolores, so what are you watching? What are you concerned about um, in, in coming days? Yeah, no, I would agree with Lisa and Bob. Clearly, testing is a major issue. I pay a lot of attention to whether it's being um, uh, made available to communities that have had lower rates of testing and groups that are just afraid to come hold forward because that's gonna have to be done very explicitly like we've done in the past with other diseases. We need a lot of outreach. Uh, so there is actually a workforce that uh, has to be created now, people that are gonna do all that outreach and that has to be uh, done very carefully. Uh, and uh, I'm, also, um, I'm also really concerned about how this has become a, such a politicized issue in a very ugly way with a lot, of, a lot of racial and racist dimensions to the way people are talking about it. And I think that um, that is only gonna be heightened because on one hand, I think it's horrific. On the other hand, I think it's probably energizing um, Trump's base. So I'm extremely worried about that and watching that very carefully because I think it can become even uglier going forward. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask our panelists if they could hang with us for maybe five minutes over the hour since we started five after. There are a bunch of questions and uh, I want to at least queue up a couple of them uh, for you to respond to. And maybe um, I'll, I'll let me pose the first one and I'll let whoever wants to go at this one. We have a, a couple um, uh, coming in. First one is basically what the heck is going on with the stock market? How can we have the crisis of the magnitude? That we've seen now. I know I would note the the, the Dow is down 540 points today. It was down significantly yesterday, but there is this kind of odd relationship after the original plummeting uh, movement upward. Anyone want to talk a little bit about why do the stock markets look so out of sync with what we're seeing on the other two, side? Two reasons. Uh, you've had so much economic concentration in this country, particularly if you look at the Nasdaq that the NASDAQ is dominated by five companies. They're the big platform companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, et cetera. And these companies are doing, doing really well. So that skews the stock market as a whole. Secondly, the Fed has been throwing money at capital markets. Uh, so capital markets are doing okay. And then thirdly, the, the, the reason that the commentators tend to stress, which I think is the least important of the three, they're already looking at the recovery coming out the other side. I think that's a mistake, that's premature. But the Fed shoveling money at Wall Street and the big platform companies making so much money, that's what's propping up this stock market. 
let me ask a, another question, um, and it gets to this larger fiscal, the fiscal situation we're facing. Someone asked if we ultimately create eight packages that total 30% of GDP, six trillion or more, what are the longer term implications of that? How do we square that with not the short term recovery, but the longer term growth paths? Well, let me just say a couple things, and then I actually have to jump off because I've got a public health meeting that I have to <laughs> attend. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, there's this debate out there that, you know, we should all just become Sweden, open up the economy, wait for herd immunity to, to kick in, and we can't afford to have uh, this assistance that helps people um, stay safe during the, uh, the virus um, because uh, we're gonna pay for that in, in the economy. Um, you know, we have all these deficits and everything else. I think of what we've done over the last uh, six to eight weeks and what we're gonna continue to do um, with the restrictions that we put in place, the stay-at-home orders, et cetera, this is an investment in the future. And the money that we're seeing being paid, you know, uh, on the fiscal side is an investment, as much as an investment that Bob talked about that we need in physical infrastructure, this is an investment in the health of our economy, which is who we are. It's an investment in people. And it's an investment that I think when you think about investments, it, this is a long-term investment for, for our society. So if you think of it in, in those terms, um, the numbers don't um, seem so staggering. But I will say, I never thought in my lifetime that I would see these kinds of orders of magnitude investments, you know, not only in the United States, but around the world that would have to be made in, in, the, in the face of a pandemic. And it goes back to your opening uh, comments, David. This is really, you know, just orders of magnitude different than anything that we've experienced in the last um, 100 years. And it requires kind of orders of magnitude bigger investments um, for our future. And that, with that, I gotta go, sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lisa, we appreciate you. Sure. Bye, bye, bye all. all. If I may just add one quick yeah. word on that, David, you're yeah. going to see a lot of overdue revision of standard economic theory. What this shows is that when you have a colossal amount of idle capacity, it's okay for the Treasury, it's okay for the Fed to create money. And when you have inflation and interest rates that are effectively zero, that's the proof of the pudding that this is not doing any damage. It would do more damage not to, not to create this purchasing power. And I think the worst thing we could do once we get out of this is get into austerity mode and say, oh my God, we created all this debt. Now we got to pay down debt. That's the mistake that we made in 2010 that we dare not repeat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me ask the last question that came into Dolores. And I think it's, um, and it's several people have posed this, and I think it's everyone is grasping for some silver lining. Um, is there, and, and, the, and several of the questions I think can be capsulized in, are there aspects, are there things we are seeing uh, at the ground level, maybe not in the direct policy area, um, that can provide at least some seeds of hope of moving in a different direction when we are on the other side of, of, of the pandemic. Do you see anything in that, in that realm, Dolores, in the, in the work you're doing? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that uh, Lisa's comment uh, was spot on when she said that we are realizing as a society, of course, many people have realized this already, that uh, being a healthy population is obviously the base of being a prosperous society, an equitable society, and that people didn't want to make that connection. The U.S. has been very reluctant to make that connection. And I think now we are seeing a lot more focus, not only on universal access to healthcare, which has become like an obvious uh, question, I think more obvious to more people, which is hopeful. But also I think in terms of understanding that health is also the social determinants of health even if people are not using that language, I think that has really trickled down to non-experts. And you see, like, you know, the newspapers um, are talking about the dimensions of inequality and the relationship to the pandemic. Uh, 
in a way that is really very, very different from what we have seen uh, with previous pandemics uh, or epidemics such as AIDS and tuberculosis. So those are hopeful signs that we are understanding this in a different way than we have crisis in the past. At least, I know in terms of public health, I know I would like to hear what Bob has to say in terms of whether there is hope. You know, in terms of how uh, the narrative is uh, focusing on the economic issues. Fair enough, Bob. A, a final positive. Uh, oh, I, I I think if uh, we can win this election, I think the pandemic has shed light on all kinds of social inequities that are crying out for social investment all kinds of economic inequities that are crying out for public works, public infrastructure. And if we can get a working majority in Congress, this could be one of those turning points uh, like the New Deal. Uh, I don't want to be Pollyanna here, but I think it's not outside the realm of possibility. Thank you. Well, let me, let me start by thanking Bob, Dolores, and uh, Lisa in absentia for for really just terrific remarks um, uh, and, and I think bringing a lot of these issues to focus. Obviously a lot more to talk about. I apologize to people who had questions we didn't get to. Um, I also wanna thank um, Bethany Romano, Kate Kaplan, Joanne Beswick, Mark Carigian, and uh, Andy Gomez who have uh, really put this together and have staffed um, the session. Um, we've obviously only scratched the surface um, I would urge you um, to both follow the individual work of, of the panelists who are putting a lot of things out there on these topics from the research and the work and the policies they are doing and advising on. Um, uh, and I would uh, also uh, urge you to look at, we're going to be having continuing panels on this issue and related issues. Um, most um, uh, soon we're gonna have on, on Tuesday, May 26th, uh, our third panel on this first group series, uh, looking at impacts of COVID on health policy and public health. Um, I'm sure picking up some of the issues that were talked to here. Um, so please tune into that. We'll also put a recording of this session up on the uh, Heller website uh, if you missed some of it. Um, again, let me thank uh, Bob Kuttner, De Dolores Acevedo Garcia, Lisa Lynch, uh, and all of you for participating. Um, thanks so thanks much. Have a great day. Okay.